Welcome to the Contract Teardown Show from Law Insider, where legal experts tear down contracts from some of the most well-known companies and high-profile executives around the world. In this episode, Texas attorney Keaton Freeberg walks through an LLC agreement. So let's tear it down. Keaton Freeberg, welcome to the Contract Teardown Show. How are you today? I'm doing great, Mike. Thanks for having me. I'm excited because we are talking about a document that I think lawyers see a lot, uh, and there's so much copy-paste in this space, but you're advising companies around this document. I'll show you all what it is. It is a limited liability company agreement, this one with a company called Compound Projects. Uh, Keaton, before we dig into it, what is this uh, document? Yeah, so this document is used by members or managers of an opera- of a uh, of a company. You know, they uh, owners are going to have this in place to make sure that all the rules are set forth. Um, and everybody knows what uh, how the company is going to move forward. Uh, one reason why I really like the operating agreement or the limited liability company is because it's it's a it's created it's a creature of contracts, and so you get to design most of the rules, except for there's a few statutory unmodifiable rules. But for the most part, you get it you get to pick the rules, and if you have them in place, then the whole company abides by them. Yeah, and we'll talk about sort of the goals of the person who the people who are creating the document and how that guides how you write the document because i think that's important rather than just copy paste and write but before we do uh tell us a bit about you what brings you to documents like this yeah so i'm a attorney based in central texas and we work with real estate investors small business owners um for the most part a lot of our real estate investors are small business owners and so we uh, create we draft we uh, negotiate and review these documents on a day-to-day basis Cool. All right. So digging into this thing, this is an LLC agreement. You've got some people who decided that they want to have pass through taxation, but they want some protections from liability. They saw on the Internet that there's a thing called an LLC that saves all their, you know, it solves all their life problems. So they go to some site or some lawyer and they get an LLC. What, what's the background of this particular document that you're reading between the lines here? Yeah, so this one looks like it's a sort of maybe a real estate syndicate uh, situation where we have multiple members all investing into this business, basically giving somebody their money and saying, here, you know, take with it and and uh, and, and grow it. And in this particular situation, it, it's uh, the, the purpose of the business is to acquire real estate and, and manage real estate. Got it. So you've got presumably some people who know each other, some people who don't know each other. They're getting together and making some decisions. All right. So speaking of decisions, let's go down to five one. So there's there's ownership questions in here. There's who gets what, who gets what money. But there's also decision making is a big part of decisions like this. And I assume, you know, if I if I have an LLC, I'm going to go from I'm making all the decisions every day to holy crap. Now I've got like a document that is sort of separate from me and I have to, you know, be on purpose about the way I make decisions. Section 5.1 talks about that. It's the power and authority of the managing member. Talk to us about the managing member and how this section goes about empowering that person. Yeah, so in this particular situation, the we're going to have a, they have a member managed situation where the actual owner, the person that's doing the day-to-day uh, operations mm-hmm. is, is the uh, individual that gets to make all the decisions. Now, in some cases, we have what's called a manager-managed LLC, and at that point, we appoint somebody to make all the decisions on behalf of the LLC. And so, um, when when drafting this this document, you got to be aware of whether you're working with you know the member or the manager, because if you're working with the manager, you want to make sure that you, the scope and their abilities there uh, are 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 very broad. While if you're working with a member, you want that that. Uh, the manager's ability to be, or their, or their, uh, uh, the decision-making ability to be very, very narrow. And this one, if I'm reading it correctly, is broad, right? This is a pretty long list of all the things that uh, that this managing member can do. What's your sense of this particular version that they've used here? Do you like the way they handled these powers? It looks pretty broad. I do because as the man, as the managing member, I, I, especially if I'm, you know, if I'm representing them, I want them to be able to do anything, uh, you know, as long as it's it's directed towards the business purpose. I want them to have the ability to make decisions without having to go and consult everybody else or, or um, before making, you know, little or maybe even big decisions. Well, so what do you think about, and and I'm coming at this as, as somebody who has not um, created one of these for somebody as you're advising clients, theoretically, you could have written this as the managing member can do anything to effectuate the purpose that's written up there. Uh, You know, the purpose is described in Section uh, 2.4, I think. Um, So 
you know, we've got this purpose, which is go make money and be awesome uh, or whatever. And the managing member can do everything to go effectuate that. But then it, it does say including but not. So it's got this sort of catch all. But then it says including but not limited to and has a very long list. I think I'm down to item Y here uh, on the list of things that they can do. Why do this? Why list everything if you've already got a catch all at the beginning? Exactly. And I don't really know that it's all that necessary because they have that they have that language that says including but not limited to. So at that point, they really can carry out any of the business uh, activities that they need to. Um, and so I don't necessarily know that it's all that important until it gets to the point where we have a another member who's upset about the actions of either a manager or a member. And they and they can point directly towards that document and say, hey, look, this specific item was listed as something that I can do. Right. And to your point about how somebody pulls these things together, there's a lot of expectation setting. And so maybe that list is to train the manager, hey, this is what you can do. And to train the other uh, people who are involved, this is what this person's going to do. So let's talk about 3.2 capital contribution. So they're coming together, they're making agreements, there's somebody managing, but people are dropping money into this thing to get it going. What do you think about section 3.2 and specifically C um, and the ability to pull money back out of it? So I like the way this section was drafted because um, a a lot of times clients come to us and they say, hey, well, I I want the ability to pull, you know, I put this money in, I want the ability to pull it out at some point when I'm ready. But see, especially in this particular situation where you have a bunch of members coming together to pull funds together for a common purpose. Well, if if one person can just pull money out at any time, it really it makes it hard for the managing members to make decisions on behalf of the company and decide, you know, can we purchase this property? Can we make this? Can we make this big financial commitment if somebody can be pulling in and out of their money all the time? Mm -hmm. Um, Another huge reason uh, why I like this section is because uh, if we have an example where we have an individual, we we have our company and we have a member who's maybe they're sued or something like that. And they're, we're in court, they're found negligent and now they have a judgment credit. They owe money, they owe money to to, to a judgment creditor and they have what's called a a charging order placed against their, um, membership distributions and all a charging order is it's a lien on your distributions. It's a, ju- it's a judicial lien. And so um, a creative lawyer might go in and say, Hey, well, you have the ability to pull out your cop- uh, capital contributions in the form of the distribution. So let's go in there and let's do that. Let's get my client paid. But in this case, if I have a protection here and I say, Hey, well, look, I, I don't have the authority to, to pull that money out. You know, the manager has the authority to pull that money out and they're not going to pull it out because that would defeat the common, uh, that would, defeat the business purpose it would make it would make business harder and so um i think that this section was was drafted well got it so speaking of the managing member making decisions there's a section 3.3 series of the company and i'm going to ask the child question which is what is a series and i want to ask you just in in 3.3 what do you think about the way they handle it it says the managing member can establish these series but what does that mean that means well so So to answer the first part of your question, a series, a series is it's just a limited liability company where we have a parent company at the top, but we have the ability to split off and make what we call cells below the parent company. And these cells are just like LLCs. They're insulated from liability from from the other cells that are next to them. Um, And, you know, I, I love this. I think it works really well for real estate investors, especially when they have a bunch of different properties. You can split each each asset into its own its own little cell. Um, as far as the language in this um, particular uh, operating agreement, it's usually pulled straight from statute. It's required to be in your certificate of filing or your articles of incorporation, depending on where you are. Um, and it's also required to be in your operating agreement. And so typically it's always pulled from statute. I like always putting this language in there because, as I said, if you don't have this language in your operating agreement or in your certificate of formation, you don't have that ability. And so when I'm drafting these for my clients, I always want to put the series language in there. That way, if they want to use it, they can. And if they don't want to use it, they don't have to. But at least they have the option. I'm always sort of debating in my head what the plural of series is. This has decided that the plural of series is series. It's like moose and mooses. I don't know. It bugs me. I think it should be series, <laughs> but nobody listens to me. Uh, let's jump down yeah, to like 4.2. That. Uh, okay. there's, there's limitations on ownership and, and again, you know, the structure that you have here is some buddies and some not buddies getting together and, and doing something for a common purpose. Uh, four, two makes it difficult to change the nature of that relationship. What do you think about section 4.2 and the ownership limitations? Yeah. So, um, I think that 
the LLC is a nice kind of hybrid between the corporation where we have super strict formalities and then we have the, you know, the general partnership on the other side. It's kind of right in the middle. We have, you know, media, some formalities, not a ton of super strict formalities. But one thing that it does have is that kind of that pitch your partner role that we that we all know about. And so basically what this section says is that, you know, if, if you and me are going into business together, I, I chose to go to business with you. You know, I didn't choose to go into business with um, with your mom or your or your brother or sister. I chose you. And 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 this section says that um, without my decision or without without me agreeing, you can't go into business with anybody else. You can't transfer your membership interest to anybody else. Now, one thing that I always like to point out in here, and it's something I always talk about when I'm advising clients, is that, you know, especially if you're a manager, you know, we, we talked about manager and, and our members, if you're a manager, you have the ability to give up the economic in interest in a company. And so if, if I wanted to gift away um, economic interest to, to a child or something like that down the road, you can absolutely do so without giving away them the authority for them to operate your business, which is huge sometimes. And so, and this is where it really comes up. And so this is why this clause is so important because we want to restrict the ability for somebody to give away the, the decision-making uh, uh, capabilities, but not the economic interest. Right. Right. Um, before we get to the big picture of how you advise clients with these things, let's talk about uh, 15.8. It's it's under the heading applicable law and jurisdiction, and it talks about uh, fighting in Delaware, it's specifically in D. You see the all caps. You're waiving a right to a jury trial. Th this is, you know, in addition to a selection of law, this is a dispute resolutions uh, uh, area, it looks like. And I'm not seeing much about alternative dispute resolution. What do you think about the way they've handled uh, Section 15.8? Yeah, you got it. I, there, there's nothing as far as the in the way of alternative dispute resolution. And that's something that I always uh, push for, either a mediation provision or an arbitration provision. You know, the the we know that the courthouse is a it's a it's a costly place to air our emotions and so if we can get those out in in mediation which i've seen time and time again i've seen businesses that uh have a, a huge dispute but we go to mediation and at the end we've rekindled things and we're ready to keep moving forward so i think that those are super i think that one of the most important provisions in here this one this one lacked that provision I'm looking through this. I'm wondering where these companies are actually geographically located. Like requiring them to go to Delaware to fight this thing out, you know, might not work for anybody involved. And so not having some kind of alternative seems really odd. Well, when you and I were preparing for this, I, I pointed out this is a really long LLC. If you, if you go and you look uh, uh, at documents, you know, that you can find online, most people are mom and pop shops and they're landing on mom and pop documents. This is not that. What is it about the the relationship that you're seeing in this that that leads to? Hey, let's really talk deeply about this. If you're going to make that decision, you know, do do you feel like they put enough thought into this? It doesn't sound like that on some sections. How do you scale the size of an LLC agreement to the need? Absolutely. So just like you said, a lot of these, a lot of our clients, especially our mom and pops, and so. When we have a husband and wife coming in here, we don't need a, you know, a 70, 80 page agreement here. We need what we need really is is it's more of a, a, when you have a smaller, smaller uh, business like that, it's more of asset protection language. Like I said, you get to create a lot of these rules. And if, and if you don't make them, then they're statutorily made for you for like. So, for example, um, on a distribution uh, uh, clause or something like that, a lot of mom and pops, they, they say, you know, I want the ability to take a distribution whenever I want. And kind of going back to that uh about being oh the capital contributions and being able to pull out your money well it's the same with the with the distributions if i say if i say well um i want the ability to pull out my distributions at any time and then i'm sued and i have that charging order against me well at that point i can my creditors are going to say we'll pull that out and so mm -hmm. a simple language is tweaking in there putting instead of saying like pro rata distributions or um you know i get to take distributions based on membership interest saying non pro rata distributions in your in your operating agreement and then I have an, a manager in place that says, you know what, I'm going to let member A have a distribution, but not member B, because mm -hmm. member B either has a charging order, or maybe this would push them into a new tax bracket if they took a, a distribution in now. So these are little little uh, clauses in here that are that are really important for the for the smaller uh, for the smaller businesses. And then when you uh, when you when you start to add more people, that's when these contracts start to get bigger, and we talk more about duties and obligations. Yeah, and presumably, I mean, you can 
enter a new agreement, right? I mean, there are ways to modify that are written into this agreement that you can enter new agreements. And so, you know, sometimes I, what worries me about this reminds me of when I would help people with prenups, right? Um, you know, you can see the negotiating of the actual document becoming the thing that ends up undermining the relationship that was trying to be created in the first place. And to your point, you know, this contract is a business tool. It's not a legal tool. It's a business tool. And it's a way to get these people to cooperate in, in productive ways for a business end. And so, yeah, definitely I would, uh, uh, I would probably recommend to echo you that um, people scale the elaborate list of questions. You don't have to legalify everything, um, you know, scale the questions to, to the, the task at hand. So Keaton, um, what if people want to learn more about making those kinds of decisions about how to scale these, uh, these documents to the task at hand, what's the best way to reach out to you? Um, they can either email me at um, Keaton at fmsplc.com or they can go to our website and you can, you can log in for our, or sign up for our newsletter or something like that. Our, our website is freeborgandmortonplc.com. So uh, those would be the best ways. And, and yeah, we can, we can chat about it all day long. Perfect. We'll have that information at the blog post over at lawinsider.com slash resources. And if you want to be a guest on the Contract Teardown Show, just email us. We are at community at lawinsider.com. We will see you all next time. Keaton, thanks again. Have a good day. Awesome. Thank you so much. You too. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of the Contract Teardown Show from Law Insider. If you're enjoying the show, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. That helps others find the show. We really appreciate it. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you in the next episode.